Hello, print friends, and welcome to the 13th episode of Pine Copper Lime, the internet's number one printmaking podcast. I'm your host, Miranda Metcalf. I release an episode of the podcast every two weeks, and on the off weeks, I publish an article on the Pine Copper Lime website. Last week, the article was about Mirabeau Press in Buffalo, New York. I spoke with the three co-founders about their journey from meeting at SUNY Buffalo to converting a 6,800-square-foot factory into their dream studio. They just opened last August, so it's some pretty new and exciting stuff. Give it a read. Let me tell you, friends, it is some pretty fun times over here at Pine Copper Lime headquarters in Sydney. First and foremost, I want to give a huge thank you to anyone who has come on board as a Patreon supporter. You have officially bought my love. And for anyone who's wondering, yes, that does start at just a dollar a month. If you haven't had a chance, head on over to the Pine Copper Lime Patreon page and check out all the levels. It's some pretty good stuff. And honestly, it's just wonderful to see this community growing. And I'm just getting started. I actually have a big announcement, but you're going to have to tune in again in two weeks' time to hear it. I'm super close to being ready, but I want to make sure everything is perfect for you all before I launch. It's going to be a pretty big deal, and I have some special perks just for all you loyal Pine Copper Lime listeners that I can't wait to share with you. Printmaking forever. Shun the non-believers. Join the party. My guest this week is Craig Anzelowitz from Awagami Factory, a paper mill which has been making washi by hand for eight generations. Awagami is located in Shinogawa Village on the Shikoku Island, which is the smallest island of the big islands which make up Japan. There, the mountains and rivers provide the fiber and water necessary for washi paper making. As you'll hear, I'm super prepared for this interview, and I completely mess up the title of the factory at the very beginning, so bonus. But Craig is a really generous guest and has incredible information to share about everything that's going on at Awagami Paper. We talk about their residencies, exhibitions, the on-site museum, the differences between Western and washi paper, and just the incredible history of that factory. And to put some icing on this cake, Awagami has partnered with Pine Copper Lime for a giveaway of 50 sheets of their editioning paper. That's all happening over at the Pine Copper Lime Instagram page, so head over there if you want to join up. As always, there's a link in the show notes. Without further ado, here's Craig. Hi, Craig. How's it going? Good morning, Miranda. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining me. I think that you might be the... um, closest in time zone to anyone I have ever brought on Pine Copper Lime before. All right. Yeah, it was actually, we're both in the morning for once. The future. Right, exactly. Yeah, you and I in the, in the Eastern Hemisphere, we're, we're used to the, uh, you know, wishing happy birthdays a little bit early and all of that to our friends, I think. Well, I'm super excited to have you on um, because this is going to be a, something a little bit different for Pine Copper Lime is I'm talking to someone who is a printmaker, but also you're a part of the amazing Awagami Print Factory, or I guess is or is what's the what's sort of like the official title? Are you guys the Awagami Print Factory, or the Awagami Print Enterprise? Like, what's your your full official title? Yeah, we have a we have a couple of different titles. Uh, the, the full Japanese name is so long, I won't get into it. But for- <laughs> <laughs> International, you know, we just go by Awagami Factory. Of course, we're first and foremost uh, paper mill, long, long established. And then more recently, we've been developing the the print side of the business, working with printmakers and so on and so forth. But for paper making or Japanese washi, um, we are now eight generations strong. That is amazing. So now you do, as I sort of alluded to, you have a personal background in printmaking, right? You studied it. Yeah, way back in the day, um, in the 80s and early 90s, I studied uh, printmaking and have my MFA in printmaking and papermaking. The paper thing came as a direct result of being, you know, the poor printmaking student (laughs) and I needed to make paper to addition. And I fell in love with the papermaking process as I was doing lots of woodcuts, which was also a very, you know, hands-on tactile print form. 
So making paper, doing these woodcuts um, seem to go hand in hand. So yeah, I'm really happy now to be involved in paper so I can talk to printmakers because I, I know their struggles and their questions. I've been through it before, so I'm, I'm happy to demystify uh, washi Japanese paper for them. Yeah, definitely. I would love to get into some of that, the differences between the, the washi and the Western style paper when we, we get a little on, because I know that's something that many printmakers are curious about. But you're from New York City, um, but you've lived in Thailand. And now, as we just were chatting about, you're based in Osaka at the moment. Uh, how did you end up making that transition? Yeah, well, after um, university, went back into the city, into New York, and started working as a buyer for Kate's Papery, which was like this uh, wonderful paper emporium, uh, three or four stores in Manhattan. And we carry thousands of papers for all kinds of art and craft and hobby and correspondence and so on and so forth. And that led me to traveling around, talking to paper makers, and really being 100% immersed in, in paper culture and met all sorts of wonderful people, really passionate artisans and craftsmen from South America to Europe to Africa and to Asia, of course, uh, the birthplace of, of paper. Working at Kate's Papery, running this big paper department, I happened to have met the people from Awagami, stayed in touch. Later on, after a few more uh, jobs as a uh, designer and buyer, I ended up in Thailand running my design business, designing home furnishings and uh, interior design and also stationery. So I always, I always kept in touch with my paper roots and eventually kept going east, further and further east, and ended up here in Japan where I'm working with Awagami, who actually my wife is the daughter of the current president of the mm. company. And so Awagami, is that the, the family name then? No, well, Awagami breaks down to Awa, A-W-A, is the old name of the region where the mill is located. Mm. And if you're Japanese, right. you, you kind of know this, this word Awa. Uh, it's for a, a region in Shikoku, which is the smallest of the main islands in Japan. And it's an agricultural heartland. So that's Awa. And then Gami, G-A-M-I, is just, a, it's another word for, for paper, like washi. So ga Awa Gami is paper from the Awa region. And so Awa Gami Paper Factory, it's been going on for eight generations, which is incredible. So I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about that, that history. I'm sure there's some amazing stories in there. Paper making, of course, um, began in China um, 2,000 years ago or so, and uh, eventually made its way through the Korean Peninsula and into Japan, where it was really, I wouldn't say perfected, but was, you know, as Japanese tend to do, they, they really treat things as an art form and push the creative potential of things, including paper. And it really flourished here in Japan. So for us, our region has always been an agricultural heartland. So starting in, I would say it's about the 8th century, about 1300 years ago, our region started cultivating kozo or mulberry and, and hemp for paper making for nobility, the shogunate and the ruling class. So paper making in our region is about 1300 years old. Hemp actually was also grown for cloth, textiles, clothing, etc. And paper making um, for us began eight generations with many families in the region as a sort of, I guess you would say, a um, cooperative where during the winter time, people would make paper and gather it and then sell it to a trading company typically in Osaka. And the paper would then uh, be dispersed throughout the country. The reason I say winter time is because in those days, paper making was really a uh, winter time activity because in the spring, summer, fall, most of the paper makers were farmers. Mm. So they're growing vegetables and fruit and so on and so forth. And then when the winter months came, the, the fiber, the kozo or hemp was gathered and processed and paper making then took place over the winter, cold, cold winter months. As it turned out, cold mountain water is actually better for paper. So everything became, you know, quite in sync with wintertime. Many generations later, 
most of the people in our village or our cooperative stopped making paper, which in general happened throughout Japan. We eventually were one of the very few families still making paper. Up until about, uh, let's see, uh, about 100 years ago, we really probably were the last one in our cooperative to make paper. And we stopped doing agriculture and became paper makers full time. And what led to the, the decline in paper making in the region? Well, in Japan in general, you know, there's a number of factors. The key aspect, I guess you would say, is following the war, uh, World War II, with the westernization of Japan, most traditional crafts, um, not only paper, slowly began to decline. Furthermore, you put on top of the fact that it's a very labor-intensive process. It's very hard work. It takes a while to perfect the skill. And young people, kind of enamored with Western culture, saw it as a part of old Japan, mm. um, not contemporary Japan. And following the war, then in the 50s and 60s, of course, Japan started becoming more prosperous. And people moved to the cities. And this kind of old world craft began to decline. Well, I know plenty of printmakers who are very thrilled that the family has continued um, and speak very highly of the Awagami paper. So we're very happy that that's still going on. Although we're paper makers, you know, we are, and and not just myself, but, you know, we are print enthusiasts. Mm. So of course, there's a long tradition that we've been making paper for Mokohanga, Japanese woodblock printing. But um, we, including the current director, um, seventh generation, um, Mr. Fujimori, he is also you know, a print enthusiast and a collector. And we are first and foremost of all the art forms that we um, enjoy and, and try to find artists to collaborate with is our printmakers. So for someone who maybe is just starting out on their paper journey or printmaking or just someone who maybe doesn't know, I'd love to start with just some of the basic differences between washi or Japanese paper and and Western paper and sort of what you can do with it that maybe you're not going to be able to do with Western paper as a printmaker? I guess first, we don't ever in Japan use the term rice paper, but perhaps in the West, you know, many printmakers and people new to the medium just generally refer to this type of Asian style paper as rice paper. Mm. Yeah, so we call it washi. Um, in Korea, you know, they call uh, hanji. Um, and these papers are typically made from kozo and other natural fibers, gampi, mitsumata, without getting too detailed, but all natural fibers. They tend to be thinner yet remarkably stronger when compared to Western paper. The difficult part with Japanese papers is that there's many different kinds of papers with long Japanese names that are difficult to pronounce and makes getting really involved in, in Japanese paper a little tricky. So from the get-go, when I came aboard, I really wanted to demystify washi and make it easy for printmakers to know the basic fundamentals of how washi can help them realize new creative avenues in their print work. But in general, I would say just think of washi as thinner yet stronger and suitable for multimedia, beading, soaking, and so on and so forth. Typically, washi will be about 50 to 100 grams. Of course, there's heavier and thinner, but your typical printmaking Western sheet is more in the realms of 200, 250 grams. Western sheets are mostly made up of cotton and wood pulp, and what and Japanese is mainly kozo, which is a mulberry, and other versions, mitsumata, gampi, are types of Daphne plants. And we also use some hemp and bamboo fibers as well. We have a section on our website called Washi Basics, which is a couple of pages long, which will also give you a a general understanding of the process of making uh, washi and the types of differences you can expect when working with washi. Oh, great. Good. I will put a link in the show notes to that for sure then. And so speaking of process, as you know, printmakers tend to be very process-oriented, And I know there would certainly be some people who'd be interested in just hearing an overview of the actual creation, the basic steps that it's going to go through from plant to an etching press. Absolutely. So since Kozo is the, you know, the primary fiber, let's say the main fiber, we'll concentrate on that one. You know, like I had mentioned, you know, Kozo is still typically the plant itself 
is typically harvested in the winter and it's quite thick. And the branches of this mulberry or kozo, they grow back annually. So you can use the same plant for 100 years. If it's tended to and treated with TLC, um, you can use the same kozo plant year after year after year. So the strongest branches are harvested in the winter and then they are steamed. Now, once these branches are steamed, you can easily remove the outer bark from the pith or the core, which is not used. That outer bark contains of three layers, the barky woody layer on the outside, and then there's a green layer of fiber in the middle, and then the inner part um, has a white fiber, which is very, very long. They must be separated so you get to that inner white fiber. So it's steamed, cleaned, and then eventually you get down to this really beautiful fiber that is later cooked to further break it down and make it a bit softer. And then it's beaten. You know, in the West, you would say, oh, the fiber goes in a Hollander beater. So it's basically beaten either by hand or in a type of Japanese machine, a type of beater that's similar to a Hollander beater. But because the fibers are so long, they're typically three to four, sometimes five or six times longer than cotton fibers. We always want to preserve the length because this gives the paper its strength. So we never cut the fibers. For instance, cotton that goes in a Hollander beater, the fibers can be cut and shortened. But we always protect in every process from cleaning to cooking to beating, you always want to preserve those long fibers. But after beating, there's another cleaning layer, then it becomes a pulp, which is placed in a vat and paper making, sheet forming proceeds. And the sheet forming, it's a variation on Western uh, sheet forming, of which I'm sure your listeners have, have seen some images or videos. And if they go to our website or Facebook, we have lots of videos showing the paper making process as well. But it's a really beautiful, poetic type of dance between the paper maker and the vat of pulp uh, when they're pulling sheets. It's a very difficult, strenuous process and paper makers themselves are awarded in Japan as expert craftsmen, master craftsmen, depending on the level they achieve are bestowed by the government as sacred treasures of the country. So it's a very, it's a very respected craft and the sheet forming process itself is very beautiful to watch. It's not so hard to do, but of course, it's very, very hard to, to perfect. I will definitely put links into some of those videos too in the show notes because I think I've seen them a couple of times and they're just gorgeous. It's like watching someone dance or something. It's a very beautiful process to watch. And the sheets themselves, you know, to, to make sheets that are so thin time and time again is, is very complex. Um, and there's a lot of subtleties to the process. But after sheets are made, they're, they're later pressed and dried, sometimes in the sun, sometimes in a drying room. And then the sheets are removed, inspected, and then shipped off to happy printmakers around mm. the world. So when you're talking about the Kozo fibers being longer. Mm -hmm. I can't, I guess I'm having trouble actually picturing like how long. Are they 10 centimeters? Are they 100 centimeters? Kozo, the fibers themselves on average would be about 10 millimeters long. They can be upwards of 15 millimeters. So let's say on average they're 10 millimeters. The interesting thing is hemp can be on average about 25 millimeters, so even longer and stronger. But with that length, it also becomes very coarse. Mm. So the paper is not quite as as luxurious or supple. For instance, Kozo at 10 millimeters is probably about twice to three times as long as cotton. And of course, it's about five or six times longer than wood fiber. So it's, it's a real sweet spot for fine paper. Um, it gives you the, the strength, but it also gives you the flexibility, the suppleness that you need for different art and conservation purposes. And then what you were saying about how the plant can have a longevity itself if it's cared for in the right way, that must make this a pretty environmentally sustainable kind of paper making then, yeah? Yeah, well, you know, of course, in, in these days and times, you know, people like to say, you know, eco-friendly, um, this is a green product, so on and so forth. But, you know, in Japan, that has always been kind of part of the culture, so... It's not really used 
in marketing here, but absolutely, you know, our Kozo, we grow on the side, we're in the valley, and then our Kozo grows in the mountains around us, and we have one or two gentlemen who are out there tending to the plants, making sure that they are growing properly year after year. Um, sometimes we have some deer or other other animals mm. that cross in and, and eat a bit, but the trees themselves, you know, they have to be pruned properly and they have to be cared for so that the yield um, every year gives us, you know, A plus fiber. And then also just to sort of take a little bit of a pivot here and move away yep. from the, the nitty gritty of the paper making. I also know that awagami is actively involved in supporting artists through collaborations and residencies and exhibitions. Um, so I know that there are a couple of people have specifically asked me when I get you on the line to talk more about that, mm. and particularly maybe the Awagami International Mini Print Exhibition that the call is going to open up about the time this podcast publishes. Well, you know, we we love working with artists. You know, like I said, I'm a I'm a printmaker, and my um, my family we're print collectors, and we've been working with printmakers. Western printmakers since the 70s. Mr. Fujimori started working with Ken Tyler um, of Tyler Graphics and, and Gemini uh, in the U.S., developing papers for people like Frank Stella, Richard Serra, Helen Frankenthaler, and so on and so forth. So we learned a lot from these artists as well. Even though we're making paper for hundreds of years, you know, printmaking evolves and artists evolve, and we learn as much from them as they do from us. So we've always had an open dialogue and a willingness to collaborate. Now, those are some, you know, pretty heavy-hitting artists there, but we also love collaborating with even, you know, creative school children. They can teach us things. Mm -hmm. Printmakers, painters, mm -hmm. all kinds of artists are interested in paper, but we found that printmakers, you know, have an inherent need and love for paper more so than other art forms, and um, we're always looking to to keep an open dialogue with printmakers, professors, we visit SGC and other printmaking activities around the world, trying to, you know, once again, demystify washi and work in the spirit of collaboration so that we can, we can all grow together and push printmaking and show people that print is not dead. Yeah. So whether or not that's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, creating a mini print exhibition or creating papers for hybrid, you know, digital plus traditional printmaking, um, we are really hoping to push forward paper making and printmaking into, you know, the next generation and, and further along the line. The mini print exhibition you mentioned, thank you. Yeah, we open in um, May 1st is the call, uh, open call. And this uh, mini print exhibition is a um, just the third time we're doing it. We offer about $10,000 in prizes and this has become a really wonderful opportunity to show your prints in Japan. We exhibit all prints. Last one, we had about 900 prints. So this, this one, we really we want to promote both contemporary printmaking, but also washi. So all the prints entered must be on a washi paper. Now, they can be on our washi. They can be on someone else's washi. We don't, we don't mind. As long as the artist is touching and using some kind of Japanese paper where we're happy. We all support each other in this small community. Mm. So when you enter the mini print, yeah, you have the opportunity to work with washi. We will send papers to people to use if they haven't used them before. And uh, yeah, it's a really wonderful way to try washi paper. And we love to involve our local communities. So we exhibit all the prints. We travel the prints throughout Japan as well, the selected winners. We also hold workshops and symposiums at the mill and our paper museum during the exhibition. So we just continue to, to push forward and try to introduce as many printmakers around the world to, to Washi as possible. That sounds like a great opportunity. You know, since I've come on board and I'm the na first kind of native English speaker, it's really been my responsibility to reach out and demystify once again, you know, Washi as much as possible um, in order for for us and others like us to, to survive. You know, the Japanese have always supported washi paper making, but let's face it, there's less and less paper makers. The Japanese community is getting older and we need to survive. And in order to do so, we have to reach more people in the Western world. And so 
this mini print competition is one way to do so. So you have the exhibition that you mentioned, but then also there's residencies as well. Yes. So we have a few different programs and we have residencies, but we also have workshops throughout the year. So every January we have a workshop and then we have our big international workshop every summer for one week where we teach all facets of paper making as well as Japanese book binding as well as indigo, natural indigo dyeing. That's a week-long workshop open to everyone. But then we also host universities. So if you're a university and you have 10 students or more, we can make a program for your school. So we work with Princeton and RISD and University of Wisconsin and University of Kansas and some universities out of Singapore and Hong Kong. So we open the mill to custom tailor you know, these, these workshops for students. And then we also have residencies We have a visiting artist program where we charge a very, very nominal fee for artists to come and develop a body of work. And then we have our fully funded, we call AIR, Awagami Artist in Residence. And that's a fully funded, we we pay for everything for the artist to come and work for uh, up to two months. And we do that every October. There's an open call for that, fairly competitive because there's only two spots and we typically get about 80 applications. So it's uh, two months in October. What we're trying to do with finding those artists are artists who are looking to push the medium and either push paper or print or both. Really help the print and paper medium move forward. So part of the application process, you know, you have to submit your uh, intended work and what you're looking to do. And our jurying committee is really searching for international artists who they don't have to be familiar with paper, but they have to be looking to do something unusual that can use paper and or print. Now, connected to the mill, we have a full hybrid printmaking studio. So you can do etching and woodcut and litho and it's silkscreen and digital printing as well. So if you can combine digital plus traditional plus handmade paper, yeah, we we really are interested in in those kinds of artists. Oh, that would be so exciting to see what comes out. Yeah, and we've had we've had artists the last few years. We've had senior artists who are, you know, in their 60s and have an established career, and we've also had artists who just came out of college, literally graduated and in their first fall, um, they came to to work with us because their ideas were so outstanding that we we really wanted to to have them. So it's a it's a really nice way to push the medium. We'll send an announcement for this um, fully funded program in another month or so. So if you're on our mailing list, you just go to our website and yeah, you'll get an announcement in about a month how to apply. It's really great to hear that the selection process, it sounds like, is based on your ideas and the merit of them and, you know, not just your CV, which I think is very nice to hear, particularly for emerging artists and younger artists as well, that they could get what sounds like an incredible opportunity if they just have the, uh, the great ideas for it. Yeah. And what, what we do is, you know, we have a house for the artists to stay. They can, they're two minutes walk to the mill and to the print lab. And every year we, we have two or three international artists and then one Japanese artist. Mm. So um, Mm. it's really nice to have this diversity of people. And we have limited amount of staff, of course. So the artists we tend to bring in, you know, will be concentrating in slightly different areas. So no one's stepping on anyone's feet and everyone has, you know, enough room and space if they want to work really large or perhaps they want to concentrate more in the print lab or in the paper mill. Um, so we, re- we really like to have people who complement each other and, and also who can get along. They have to live together for upwards of two months. So, you know, we want nice people too. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> That's one of the nice things about working with printmakers, though, is we, we tend to be a pretty nice group of kids. Yeah, and this is all in the spirit of collaboration because, um, you know, you will work with our master paper makers and we also have... In the digital lab, we have a master printer. So a lot of a lot of traditional printmakers, you know, they they know a bit about digital, but they they don't quite, 
you know, they're not quite master printers on, on the digital printing end, but we have staff who can help them. And then for the, the, the print lab itself, um, we don't have a master printer yet. We are still looking for somebody. That's another story. We have all, all the presses and inks and everything that, that, that they require. Do you, do you want to get into the, the, you said that's another story. Do you want to, do you want to tell that other story? Well, I can say a little bit. We will eventually look to get involved more in publishing. So we are looking for eventually to have a master printer on staff so that we can bring in more artists and then we can start publishing editions of prints on unique papers uh, regularly and then, you know, become have, have an arm of Awagami that's a publishing house, let's say, of limited edition prints. However, you know, we are in the rural countryside so getting a master printer who can speak English and Japanese and live in this countryside where we are is a little tricky. So we are still looking to tweak our system um, so that we can have a master printer at least a few months out of the year. This way we can invite even more printmakers to come uh, and, and make editions with us and open up an, an publishing arm, if you will, of limited edition prints. So this is a goal, let's say, in the next two to three years. You know, the paper and the print aspect are all in place, but um, we really are still searching for the right person to come and, and become our master printer. Even though we're nice people, there's not many on staff who speak fluent English. There's a few. So we want to have a master printer who at least has, you know, a bit of Japanese uh, language skill. So that's a little tricky, but... Yeah. We'll be fine. We'll, we'll, find, we'll find someone good, I'm sure. And I'm sure upon hearing that, that there's at least a few people now Googling, you know, Japanese English dictionary, so they might be qualified <laughs> <laughs> for the role. That's really exciting, though. And it's so wonderful to hear, you know, all of these stories about how Awagami is growing and supporting the community through everything that you, that you guys do over there. It's, it's really incredible. We're working hard. I mean, we're always seemingly behind the eight ball. We are a small company. I mean, even though we have factory in the name and we have all these programs going on, you know, we're still, you know, 40 people um, in a rural, very, very small village in the countryside of Japan. We have big aspirations and goals, but we are still a small company. So, um, you know, bear with us. We're, <laughs> we're still trying to grow and, and trying to reach as many printmakers out there as possible. So um, we like to continually educate and, you know, once again, demystify Japanese washi paper. And um, hopefully through, you know, visiting our website or Facebook or seeing us at some conference, printmakers out there will at least consider trying some washi paper. You know, when I went to printmaking school back in the 80s and early 90s, you know, you'd get the list and it's Arsh and it's Reeves and, you know, maybe Stonehenge, but, you know, it's BFK and Arsh cover. And, and that's basically it. Um, and then you would even ask the professor um, about other kinds of paper. And, you know, washi paper was so complicated <laughs> that only the real diehard professors um, would would dare to recommend uh, one or two papers, um, you know, perhaps, you know, they, they would just say Kozo for Shinkole and that that's about it. But yeah, you know, one thing is that I'm very happy if you have listeners who have specific questions or samples or something they're trying to uncover or unearth or learn about, you know, the best way to reach, reach out is you can send us a question on our Facebook page or on our website, awagami.com, and we answer everything. So um, please feel free to, to message us directly if you, if you have a technical question or any question about Washi in general. We're, we're real people and we're happy to answer. Oh, that's so good to know because I know that so often printmakers, particularly if they've left school or left the university that they were at and, and moved somewhere else, it can be kind of isolating when you're stuck in your studio somewhere and something's not working or you want to try someone and you don't you don't know where to turn and I think a right. lot of times when you just send a message on Facebook you're like does anyone even check this is anyone out there well we're, we're certainly out there and I personally answer you know every English question that's emailed to us and you know we want people to at least try some washi papers and see maybe you're in a creative rut and you need some kind of new material um, to push you in a new direction or get you thinking differently, or you want to try something and 
your cotton paper is not working quite, you know, as, as expected, or you're, you know, looking to push the envelope um, and you have, well, can I do, can I do an etching and soak this and do encaustic and da 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 da, da on top? And, you know, we'll answer those technical questions as well. You know, way back in the day when I was a buyer and trying to find all these papers and then the names are so complicated, <laughs> it just makes it very intimidating. And really what happened was is that the papers have these long Japanese names and traditionally the way that the paper made its way to, let's say, America or Australia, it went through a few different hands, whether or not it was from the original maker and the cooperative to a trading company to an exporter then to the importer then to the retail store then to the printmaker the reference name maybe got changed the code number the spelling of course would get changed right. because you know, <laughs> so people get very confused I learned also as a buyer, I was buying the same paper from two or three different people. They just use different names. <laughs> yeah, on, on that note, we really created, yeah, this is interesting because we really created Awagami as a brand. Um, our company is really, you know, Fuji Paper Cooperative, but Awagami was created as a brand back in the in the 80s to protect the mill and for people to have an actual brand to hang their hat on meaning that it's not just kozo paper well there's kozo paper from 50 different mills in japan and then even paper coming out of other asian countries would be called kozo paper so you know like this arch there's fabriano there's reeves there never really was a mill associated with specific Japanese paper. So although we don't watermark and never will watermark our papers with the mill, um, the brand logo or anything like that, we did create the brand back in the 80s as a way to protect and um, for artists to know where the paper was coming from. Now, sometimes it's a little tricky because our distributors or retailers don't use the brand Awagami and just use the paper name, mm -hmm. but we try to encourage anyone who sells our paper to use the brand just to give the artist a peace of mind to know where the paper comes from, its lineage and so on and so forth. And in case they have a technical question, you know, sometimes people send paper samples to me and they say, Oh, I bought this Awagami Kozo paper and it, it doesn't respond to my collagraphs the way it did five years ago. You know, I'll look at the paper and, you know, we'll test it and so on and so forth. And, Often it's it, it's not our paper at all. Sometimes it's not even Japanese paper. Mm. It comes from Southeast Asia or another country. So um, this is also something that maybe you know proved intimidating to artists and frustrating is that you know then when they buy Arsh cover or Reeves BFK, pretty much guaranteed if they buy it you know this year or they bought it five years ago, it's going to act the same way. And they have the watermark and they have the the heritage to to prove it so we're trying to do something similar with with washi that's such a good point that now that you mention it it's kind of obvious but it hadn't occurred to me before you don't see the same brand names with washi as you do as you say with these you know the reeves and you know these big big brand names with the the cotton paper so of course that's going to get confusing for people yeah well, you know in japan the paper maker even even though Okay, we're a contemporary company. We're, but the paper maker has always been the humble craftsman. And putting a watermark on the paper was, they're too humble to do that. Mm. that that's the artist, the artist puts the name on the paper, not the mill, not the paper maker. That's for the artist to put the name. So Japanese mills will never put a watermark on the paper. It just is kind of against the grain and the philosophy of, the humble craftsman but you know we are in a different era and we need to survive so we won't put the watermark but we did create the brand name um, and we try to encourage people to use it um, whenever possible and this has helped us a bit to to survive as well um, for people to know and um, if anyone is hearing this and thinking, you know I, I really would like to try some of that paper Awagami has generously donated to Pine Copper Lime's next giveaway. It's going to happen on the Instagram, which is 50 sheets of the Awagami editioning paper. So that should pop out probably about the exact same time that the podcast is published. So look at that and 
that could be your chance, printmakers. <laughs> yeah, well, thank thank you for working with us on that. We're we're happy to support printmakers all over the world. People know Japanese things are of high quality and and have heritage and history, but at the same time, they know Japanese things tend to be a little expensive, so maybe they're a little inhibited to try. But here's your chance. Yeah, you can win. Okay. <laughs> and, and uh, yeah, we um, we look forward to seeing whoever wins the paper, what kinds of prints they're making on the paper. So please share and repost and tag us so we can see what you're you're doing with our paper. Oh yeah, definitely. If the lucky person who wins shares what they make, I will definitely repost that on Pine Copper Lime as well so we can see what we're doing. This is one of the things, you know, I mean, social media, it's kind of a catch-22 um, for us because, you know, some people say, oh, you know, you're a craftsman, you shouldn't be all over social media. Mm -hmm. But the same yeah. way, you know, we're a business too and we're so far away from people that actually social media has become a blessing because we can reach people from our little village and we can reach people in Australia, we can reach people in, in South America even, you know, and then we get inquiries all the time and people reposting and the community grows. And, you know, printmakers too have always been a bit of an outsider group. And I, I say that as a printmaker myself, you know, you know, painters and sculptors, you know, they get all the glory. And, you know, printmakers have always had to band together and whether or not it's through SGC or Impact, you know, create a, a community that we can fully appreciate what, what each other is doing, you know, and paper maker and we're kind of the same way. You know, we, we want to enjoy this community of social media and, and share with other like-minded paper and print enthusiasts and you know once again you know demystify the process and and learn from from printmakers as well so when i see a post with someone you know using our paper and they tag us and oh that process looks very interesting you know oh they're doing you know etching with digital print plus you know stitching on the sewing machine and da 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 da, da or creating some unusual you know print book and i open dialogues with many artists um, so we can collaborate in some way or sponsor a future workshop or or an exhibition, you know, if someone's really pushing our paper in new directions, I'm more than happy, you know, to sponsor an exhibition, um, to sponsor if they teach their students to send paper out to their studio to share with their their classmates. It's all in in the spirit of, of pushing print forward. Um, and yeah, please, please reach out or tag us if you have some unique work that's that's going on on awagami paper we love to see it and we bring those images into our company meetings and believe it or not you know we we show um what people are doing within our own company and i say and, and bring in images and oh look at this artist in australia look how they're using our paper and our paper makers are often you know they're really really excited to see like oh really they use our our humble Japanese paper in such a, a unique way. We never would think that, you know, our paper can be used in such a creative application. And it, it's really heartening for them to see what they're making, um, how it's being used out there uh, in the print world. So please share. <laughs> I share. love that <laughs> so much. That is so great. I think that is a, a great place to to wrap things up because I, I think that's such a beautiful idea and story. Is there anything else that you'd like printmakers to know or or even definitely make sure to tell them where they can find you and where they can reach out to you to, to share what they're making? Well, yeah, absolutely. People can, can go to awagami.com, of course, and learn a little bit more about what we're doing and the type of workshops, events, residencies, so on and so forth that we're doing. And you can also email us through that website um, or email us through Facebook or tag us. Um, look for us on all the typical social media outlets and, and please share. And we love to share back. So um, let's collaborate with as many printmakers as possible. And the mill itself is also open to the public. So if by any chance your listeners are traveling in Japan and want to try making paper, come and visit the mill, take a look around our museum as well. We are open to the public six days a week. We're closed on Monday. So please come and visit. 
thank you so much for chatting with me and sharing this incredible Welcome. story of everything you all are doing out there. It's it's seriously inspiring. Thank you for creating the podcast itself because, um, like I said, you know, printmakers, we, we need to have a community and we need to be uh, active and sharing ideas and pushing the medium forward and uh, having a podcast now I, I see you're about a year in now yeah thank you for doing that that's that, that's really wonderful and I, I hope you get more listeners and uh, if I can be of any assistance um, you know we're, we're more than happy to to send paper to any of your listeners who are looking to do some unique works well that's our show for this week join me again in two weeks time when my guest will be Jenny Robinson We talk about her childhood growing up in Borneo, her deep printmaker pride, finding a sense of place during turbulent times for art making, and the most effective method to abandon boyfriends in the Bombay train station. I'm also going to drop my bomb about what's coming next for Pine Copper Lime. So don't miss out. I'll see you in two weeks.